One of the goals of the It's Our Air video series is to present a variety of viewpoints on air quality issues in North Carolina. All opinions expressed in this program are the personal views of the student participants and interviewees, and not necessarily those of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality's Division of Air Quality, any other state government office, or any of the sponsors of this program. I was diagnosed with asthma when I was in kindergarten. I had really bad walking pneumonia and they didn't know why it was so bad. And then they found out, oh, she has asthma. So I grew up with asthma and it's been hard at times, but really honestly, it's not that hard to manage if you just know how the air quality is gonna be. And if you use your inhaler, I'm Molly, I'm a freshman in college and I'm a voice major. So breathing is obviously a huge part of voice and I can't do that uh, with asthma very well because you can't have a note unless you have good breath. When I have an asthma attack, usually it's smoky or like the air quality isn't good. Um, I can't get enough air. It feels like I'm breathing through a straw or something. So oftentimes my asthma is triggered by air quality if the air quality is low. So I can go online and look up the air quality if it's going to be a good day for me, which is a green day, or if it's going to be like red or a lot of smog in the air. Really that's very helpful for me to know that if I need to take my inhaler in the morning, like before I even start my day, or if I need to take it before an activity or during an activity that I'm going to do. Molly is not alone. Even those of us without asthma can breathe better when the air is clear and clean. In 2002, North Carolina passed the landmark Clean Smokestacks Act, which required coal-fired power plants to reduce emissions by 75% over an 11-year period. Guess what? It worked. In fact, the goals were met quicker than anyone thought they could be. Let's take a look back at how this successful policy got put in place. It is now law. Governor Mike easily signed the, the turn of the new century, uh, the late 90s, uh, 2000, 2001, there were serious concerns that people had about the impacts of air pollution on health. These conversations were especially intense in western North Carolina because the damage being seen was especially noticeable there. We knew just commonsensically that we had a serious problem in the mountains. Uh, just the, the views that we had seen at one time, they were hazy. We knew when you go on top of Mount Pisgah uh, that you could, uh, had, did not have the long range views we had when I was a child. Uh, we knew that when you were on top of Mount, Mount Mitchell that uh, you didn't have the views. We knew that trees were dying. Uh, so that to, the, to us lay people and just local folks, we knew that we had a problem without being told we had a problem. But as, as time went on, we recognized that it started hurting our tourist industry because people just don't come to the mountains to, they come for long range views and to get away and to have clean air and, and good health. Uh, then it started impacting just the health of, of, of our residents and people there. We were getting that from the Lung Association. The American Lung Association gave us plenty of data that demonstrated that. Uh, our local doctors, our local hospitals were giving us information that, that, that supported that the, the air was having an impact on the health of the region. In fact, asthma is a leading cause for missing school in North Carolina. I missed a ton of school, especially in the fall when we start getting back to school and everybody gets sick, everybody gets colds. But with asthma, it just, it knocks you out for like a week at a time. So in 2001, Representative Nesbitt, Martin Nesbitt and I introduced the uh, Clean Smokestack Bill. They did it with input from a variety of interest groups ranging from environmental groups to uh, utilities to western North Carolina businesses like Grandfather Mountain and um, the discussion began that way. When we look back at what was going on and how much air pollution could be seen by the naked eye, it's important to remember that you can't always see air pollution. Sometimes what you can't see can have just as serious an impact on human health as what you can see. We have data that show a correlation between reduction in air pollution and reduction in deaths related to respiratory diseases. So we can see that the Clean Smokestacks Act saved lives. It also improved the quality of life. 
I was a toddler when the Clean Smoke Stacks Act was passed, and honestly, it's improved the air quality and my quality of life so much. I can't even imagine how it would be if that hadn't have been passed. It was 2001 that the act was first proposed, and in that year it passed the North Carolina Senate, but stalled in the North Carolina House over concerns about costs. Would um, the uh, rates of industrial electricity customers rise in some significant way that might uh, impede uh, their ability to do business at a time when the state was in a recession. The technology was the first question. What would you have to do to reduce these emissions substantially? We told them, we talked with our engineering folks, and then the question became, who's gonna pay for it? And we were assured by members of the General Assembly, don't focus on that. We will deal with the question of cost and who pays for it after you tell us what can you do to get these emissions down. All the interested parties in that question of cost did some really innovative problem solving and came up with a way that uh, the industrial customers uh, could uh, live with, that the utilities could live with, that uh, the state's public interest in pollution control was served by, and um, uh, Governor Easley was at the heart of those discussions and did a uh, terrific job of helping get, the, get those different interests to come together in a problem-solving way. Some people wanted us to put controls on every plant. Members of the General Assembly recognized that it didn't make sense to spend large sums of money on very old plants that likely were not going to be in service for much longer. So there was a back and forth about which plants were going to be around for a long enough period of time to put the controls on cost effectively. The technology to reduce these SO2 sulfur dioxide emissions was pretty tried and true. There were facilities in Europe and some parts of the U.S. that this equipment had been put in place. And it's a large, almost the size of a 10-story building that has a lot of water flowing inside of it. They're called scrubbers. You know, when I look back on this legislation, it, it required uh, agreement between a lot of groups who typically may not sit at a table and work together. But in this case, um, the groups that were at the table came up with a simple solution that everybody bought into. And in terms of my career in the environmental field in North Carolina for over 30 years, this is a signature event. I mean, it was a cast of thousands when we were in a room. And it's basically the Representative Nesbitt and myself, we would chair those meetings and working out, we went through draft after draft of the bill. So to me, it, it is, the, the, the passage of it is, is an example of what you can do if you bring a lot of folks together. This is a, a fantastic North Carolina success story. Uh, out ahead of federal requirements, the state uh, passed this innovative law. It was implemented in just the way that the different um, interest groups had hoped it would be. The significant re emissions reductions were achieved. The air got cleaner. People's health has gotten better. And the skies have gotten bluer. 